Good morning. Welcome to class. Whether you're here or there, welcome to class. We're going to cover a seasonal topic today. Uh, next week we'll start our official scheduled class in the auditorium here, but today since it's a holiday weekend, I want to talk about God Bless America for a little while. Uh, that whole concept, uh, usually at this time of year, that's what people talk about. Uh, I know usually at this time of year, that's what I talked about when I was preaching full-time or teaching or whatever. Uh, it seemed normal to talk about that. Uh, God bless America. This year, it's a little different, isn't it? Uh, this year's real different. Uh, some folks may be thinking, if this is blessing, I don't want to ever see a curse. <laughs> uh, things seem completely out of whack. Uh, and others, of course, express the, the opinion that uh, God doesn't bless America, God shouldn't bless America, God can't bless America because America is so evil and horrible and despicable. Uh, so we hear a lot of strange things this year at this time of year. Uh, and that's one reason I decided we'd talk about it in here. The fourth has kind of been pandemic uh, Didn't have a complete fourth like we usually do, it seems. Uh, we've also got a mindless faux revolution going on, so it makes the fourth just a strange holiday in some ways which maybe is more important, makes it more important that we actually talk about it today. So, let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, I found a quote by John Adams. We used it last night at the, the fourth party we had. Uh, John Adams, of course, was one of the founding fathers. But when it came time to sign the Declaration of Independence, uh, July 4th, 1776, or July 2nd, whichever you, you want to go with. But anyhow, in that time frame, uh, on July 3rd, John Adams wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail. And he said in it about this holiday, this date, which wasn't a holiday yet, it was just a, an event. Uh, here's what he said. He said, uh, it ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parades, with shows and games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. Okay. Uh, that's what John Adams thought about what they were doing that day and how important it was. And one thing I want to mention in there particular is the first thing he says is not about the fireworks and the, all the parades and all the things that we associate with the 4th of July. The first thing he said was it ought to be commemorated by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. Okay, uh, That's a little different view than we have of it now or of what history portrays of it. And I think he recognized, and we need to recognize, that Psalm 33, 12 is a true thing. Uh, it's a verse you're all familiar with. Uh, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Um, and that passage, which I want to go through here a little bit because I think it's something we need to get in our minds this year especially. Uh, the psalmist wrote Psalm 33, and the first part of it is all about why we ought to praise God. We ought to praise God because He's the Lord of nature. He's the Lord of history. He's sovereign. He's all-powerful. Uh, people ought to praise Him. 
I read the first nine verses or so of Psalm 33, and you'll see that. And then in verses 10 and 11, he starts to talk about how God interacts with nations. And he says he deals with nations. Uh, he, he brings them up and takes them down and, and all of that. He's a sovereign God. And then in verse 12, he get, comes to this verse where he starts talking about what we want to talk about today. Verse 12, he says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Now understand the first part sets us up for this. He says God is sovereign, he's all powerful, he's the Lord of history, he's the Lord of nature, he deals with nations, and blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord because of who he is. Then he says in verses 13 through 15, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. So he, he reminds us that this all sovereign, all powerful God is watching. He knows exactly what's going on. He watches all his children. He pays attention. He watches mankind. Next passage, 16 through 17. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue What's the psalmist telling us here? Almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God rules over nations. He rules over everything. Now, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God's watching mankind, and he's the one who wins battles. Yeah. In the earlier part of the psalm, he said, nations think they're running things. But they aren't. He wins battles. Next few verses, verses 18 through 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. He sees, he delivers those who fear him. He's watching all of mankind. He's the one that's going to win battles, and he's listening to those who fear him. Okay. And then the final couple of verses of Psalm 33, verse 20 and 21, 22. Psalm almost wraps it up this way. He says, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts are glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Okay, so this almost closes all of this picture that he's painted for us by saying when it all comes down to it, he's our help. He's our hope. He's our shield. We got to trust him. Okay. Now, Psalm 33 is good all the time. But right now in America, Psalm 33 is pretty important. It reminds us of a whole lot of things that the news doesn't remind us of. That all the stuff we hear, anytime we turn on anything or read anything, uh, doesn't sound like Psalm 33. But Psalm 33 is still true. So, Taking all of that and going back to the, the very first verse, verse 12, uh, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And I want to talk about that for the rest of the time here, and probably it's a little closer to random thoughts than it is a organized speech about anything, uh, because I've got a lot of random thoughts about this, and I bet you do too. Uh, 
day to day, hour to hour, we, we turn on the news and see something, we think, what in the world is going on? What are we going to do about this? How are we ever going to survive this? All that. Well, Psalm 33 may help us some, but let's think about this. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord for a little while. Uh, and the first point I want to make is that the news, the current events, what's going on now, makes us question, uh, probably should make us question, uh, well, who is Lord in America? Is Jehovah God Lord in America? That doesn't seem like it when we watch what's going on. Uh, but whether he is today or not, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, I want to tell you a few things that I'm pretty sure of, and I, you may or may not agree, but I think history bears me out. And the first random thought I had is that God has blessed America. Okay, uh, We can argue about the future in a little bit, but let's get this fact down. God has blessed America. And we hear so much today about how uh, evil and uh, despicable America is, that, that there's nothing good about it, that people begin to question, you know, well, has America really been blessed by God? Well, if you read some history, and not just some history, but history, because you can look at a lot of partial history or even bad history, but if you, if you read history, uh, this nation was founded by people who trusted God. Yeah, that's indisputable if you read some history. And because they trusted God, uh, I believe that he blessed that trust and he blessed this nation. Now, I, I know people have heard different. People have been taught different. Uh, I saw one thing not too long ago. Somebody posted uh, on social media that America was the greatest country in the world. And a younger person responded to that and said, how can you say that? How can you say America is the greatest country in the world with all the flaws it's got? Okay, that's a topic that we could talk about, but let's do a little history here first and understand that God has blessed America. The, the people who founded this country, not just the founders, but the citizens who joined in the revolution. I mean, it's a pretty big step if you were a farmer or a shopkeeper to say, okay, I'll help you take on the greatest army in the world. Okay? Those people trusted in God. Okay? And when you read history, you see it over and over and over again. And I know current false history tells us that all the founders were deists and atheists and they didn't believe in God and all that. Read some history, folks. They were educated in theology. Bunches of them trained to be ministers before they went into politics. Okay? Their writings were full of Bible quotes. That's how they thought. That's what they based everything they did on. Okay? Uh, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, I don't know. I know the beginning's important. It says all men are created, created equal, and endowed by their Creator. And I know people point at that and say, "Well, see, there they believed in God." But that's not the important part. I mean, it's important, but at the end, and bear in mind what they were doing, they were challenging the greatest empire in the world to a fight. Okay? And at the end of it, they said, we appeal to the supreme judge of the world. Okay. Somebody had read Psalm 33. <laughs> they, they knew who was in charge of nations. OK, 
Okay. So they said, we appeal to the supreme judge of the world and we rely on the protection of divine providence as we pledge our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. Okay. And I don't think today we can even understand what they were really doing, the step they were taking, how much they were risking. I mean, they said it, our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. Uh, that's what they were putting on the line, and they said, we're going to trust God to take care of us. Okay. They, they trusted God. Uh, I believe that because of that, in my reading of history, I see, I, I believe God did miracles to turn the course of history. Okay. Now, there's ha things happened during that war you can't explain any other way. Now, I believe God divinely protected George Washington and others because people trusted him. And you can say, well, I don't believe that. Well, then you don't believe Psalm 33. You know, he, he can do that. That's what he does. Okay. Uh, and it's not just that I believe that, or I think that after reading history. If you read history, that's what the founders themselves believed. Uh, I'll read you the longest quote I'll read you today. Uh, the last one I think I'm going to read you, but it's from Ben Franklin. And if you've been here very long, you've heard me read it before because it's so pertinent to what we're talking about. Because bear in mind, people say Ben Franklin was the least religious. He was an atheist. He was a deist. He didn't believe in anything about the Bible. Okay, well, listen to what he said. Now, this was a few years later after they had won the Revolutionary War and they were trying to build a country. So they were in a constitutional convention to try to figure out the Constitution in 1787. And like a bunch of politicians, they'd spent five weeks, hadn't got anything done. Okay, they were all arguing and not succeeding and couldn't figure out how to get this thing going. So old Benjamin asked for the floor, and here's what he said, among a number of things, but I took a few pieces out of it. He said, in the beginning of our contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers were heard. They were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed the frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. You see what Ben was saying? There were things happened in that revolution that, yeah, he did it. Okay. Then he said, have we forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. And I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Okay, that's the guy that everybody says didn't believe in God. And what he told the other founders that day was, okay, God got us through this revolution. 
he helped us win against all odds, and we better ask him for some more help. It sounds like Ben might have been familiar with Psalm 33. God deals with nations. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of my first random thought. Is God has blessed America. And we won't go into all the ways materially and protection and on and on and on. But I believe God has blessed America. I believe it's a historical fact. Now, the second random thought I have about this topic is, well, he has blessed America, but how long will he? Well, you read Psalm 33, and you begin to wonder, how long is this going to go on? Uh, and I know God is a patient God. But we got to be trying that patience. <laughs> you look at the state of things these days and you say, whoa, how long is he going to put up with this? Because you read not just history, but you read Bible history. Uh, there comes a time for Israel and for Sodom and for all sorts of different civilizations that God says, okay, that's enough. That is enough. Okay. So that's the second thing I wonder about is how long will he continue to bless us? And I want to spend just a little time on this that because it's not really what we see in the news that concerns me. You know, I think, I think we may be a little off track here thinking about, well, God's not going to put up with this. Uh, I, the current anarchy thing going on, uh, and get me straight, I, I understand there's a huge difference between the riots and the anarchy and the pulling down statues and all that, and real protests by good people over what they see as a wrong. Okay, that's two very different things. Okay. Same people may be in the same block, but there's two very different things going on. Okay. And the, the anarchy part of it, the tear down America, abolish America, all of that, uh, I called it earlier a mindless faux revolution. Uh, I think it is. I think they have an agenda, but I don't think they really know what they're doing. You know, a, a real revolution, a, a real revolution like we had a couple hundred years ago, was led by honorable men who pledged their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honors. Okay. People leading this one have got lives, but they don't have the other two. They're just out to destroy. A real revolution starts with, here's a list of what we're going to build. Here's a list of wrongs, and here's what we're going to do about it. Okay, a phony revolution starts with, oh, let's just tear everything up because we don't like it. Don't know what we're going to do. Got no clue, and we've seen that through history. Uh, mobs do that sometimes. And that may happen to America. You know, it may be the way God chooses to say that's enough. I don't know. But uh, I don't think that's what he's going to say I've had it for. Uh, the other thing is, and I realize this is a very sensitive topic, and I'm not prepared to talk about it in detail. I'm thinking maybe I will at the end of July when I'm going to preach for two weeks. But... God's not going to say that's enough for this country because of our original sin of racism. Okay. I realize there's a problem there. That's a human problem. I understand that. I understand that there's a real justified outrage over things that happen in this country that aren't fair. 
Uh, and I think we need to talk about that sometime. But it's the current outrage, and we say we got to fix that or God's going to destroy America. we got a whole lot more deeper, fundamental violations of God's nature than that one. And I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying when we look at what this country has done over 244 years, we've done a lot of really good things and a lot of bad things. But in the past 50 years particularly, uh, we have really changed some fundamental things. Okay. First thing God did in the Bible was start the family. He said the family is how civilization is going to exist. Okay? And we've decided that the family is not important. Now, I'm not saying we. I'm not saying every citizen. I'm just saying as a country, if you look at it, that's kind of the official policy now. His family is not important. Okay? And it's changed so much that Children are being raised without a family. This may surprise somebody. It doesn't surprise God. That doesn't work. Okay? That blows civilization up. Okay? And, and I know this is a sensitive topic, but there, there's a whole lot of people that think right now, okay, we'll put on the streets and we'll put on our t-shirts and we'll put everything else, that black lives matter. Okay, black lives do matter. Okay, but there is an organization named that that is fomenting a lot of the revolution and if you look at their beliefs, their manifesto, a very key part of it is we will disrupt the nuclear family. Okay? We don't believe in, in this Western prescribed idea of having a nuclear family. And we'll set out to destroy that. Okay? That's dangerous, folks. Okay? And I realize we've already done a lot of that in this country. But that doesn't work. Okay? The, we're incensed by a murder. But if we look at what God said as soon as Noah got off the boat and started a new world, he said, all right, first thing you've got to understand is life is sacred. Life is sacred, and if somebody takes a life, they got to die, okay? And later in Numbers, you get to reading there, and God went further than that. He said, he said blood's got to be avenged for. If somebody takes a human life, there's got to be a payment for that. And if you don't take that payment, he said, their blood's going to cry out for vengeance. Okay? Well, I know we've had some uh, unjust deaths of certain people that made it on videos. But folks, this country kills almost 2,000 babies a day. Okay? 2,000 a day. 650,000 a year. Okay? We murder, and I don't, don't mean we murder, but the United States murders thousands of people a year. I don't even know how many in just like Chicago. You see the statistics of how many every weekend. Okay? God says somebody takes a human life, there's got to be a payment for that, or your ground is cursed. You add up all these deaths, 
You know how many people we executed last year? Twelve. I think it was twelve. might have been 22. I can't remember. I looked it up. Okay. You look back at God's basic principles, and you say, okay, this is off the rails. Okay. You look at some of the major things God said, immorality. Uh, I mean, God got upset enough with immorality, gross immorality, that he sent fire and brimstone. Okay. And we have made that a policy now. That we don't only accept it, we celebrate it. Okay. And I'm not here to pick on BLM, but if you read the rest of their manifesto, that's a huge part of it. We are a queer affirming network. And we want transgender leadership. Okay? That's what they're setting out to do. Okay. How long will he put up with it? I have no idea. But I do know this, because the psalm finishes with it, that God still hears. Even a few. That's what the psalm said. We're over time, so let's just finish up by reading the last couple of verses of Psalm 33, and maybe we'll find some hope in that. Behold, the lie of the Lord is on those who fear him. Does he see everything else? Yes, he already told us that. He knows exactly what's happening and why and who's doing it to who and all that. But his eyes on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver them. Okay? He's still listening. And we read this history, we see that over and over again. Israel would go off the rails, they'd worship other gods, they'd do all these things, and a few people would petition God to get us back on track. He'd grant that request. Last few verses. Here's our hope, our only hope. Our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. Our heart's glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. What do we do in these depressing times? Uh, I think Psalm 33 has got the answer. Uh, go home and read that a few times. Pray the last few verses. Uh, there is hope, but the only hope is in Him. All right, you're dismissed.